one of the things that we would say is that uh, the law always accuses. Um, the law may motivate to, it may uh, teach as well, it may be a pedagogue, um, may teach you as well. But one of the things that it, all, it may restrain and keep order, and it certainly does do that, um, but it always accuses. It always accuses. Um, and that's just something to know about. That's something to know about it when you're a pastor. It's something to know about it when you're raising children. It's something to know about it if you are if you manage people. It's just something to know about it that you may tell somebody, um, you know, and as a pastor, you may preach and sort of give the list of things that will uh, lead you to a godly life. And you got to know that there are going to be at least a decent number of people in your pews that are experiencing that as conviction. And um, then what? Which is why I'd always say it's not, it's, uh, every sermon needs to have law and gospel. But I do believe every sermon needs to end on the gospel. Um, people need to be set free from that conviction. Hey guys, welcome to the Expositors Collective Podcast, episode 131. I'm your host, Mike Neglia, and you made a good choice when you decided to download or to stream this episode. Um, You're going to listen to a fantastic conversation that I had with Dr. Scott Keith. Um, We're going to speak about the Word of God and how the Lord uses preachers as both hitmen and midwives. And here's what we mean. Here's what he means. God uses the law in the voice or the hand of a preacher to slay or kill or destroy any false notions of our own self-righteousness. And then God uses his word through the preacher to usher in the good news of his gospel and the grace which causes dead men to live again. So we speak about this and many other law gospel distinctions, and it's just a great conversation all around. Like I said, I know that you're going to enjoy it. Dr. Scott Keith is the executive director of 1517. He's the adjunct professor of theology at Concordia University in Irvine, California. He's the co-host of the Thinking Fellows podcast. He also is the author of a book called Being Dad, Father as a Picture of God's Grace. And I could go on and on. In the show notes, there'll be links where you can read his articles, uh, purchase his book, or listen to the podcasts that he contributes to. Anyway, I hope that this episode and all that we do at the Expositors Collective helps you to grow in your personal study and your public proclamation of God's Word. Hey, welcome to the Expositors Collective Podcast. I'm here with uh, Dr. Scott Keith, and uh, I'm excited to talk to him about uh, Bible teaching and preaching. I'm I'm excited to talk about uh, law and gospel and any number of wonderful diversions. So uh, good morning and welcome, Scott. Thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, you bringing me on. Hey, it's a a real treat. So it's um, the afternoon here in Ireland where I'm recording, and it's the morning where you are. We're both having cups of coffee, so it's nice to have a, a synchronized cup of coffee with you. I'm looking at a very smoky and ashy sky because we are in Big Bear, which is six miles from one of the major fires that's going on in California right now. Uh, yeah, my, my goodness. Yeah, I'm, I'm from California originally, and so I'm obviously watching the news quite, quite closely. And uh, I'm glad you're okay so far. Yeah, so far so good. Um, so, so Scott, you are the, and I might have the title correct, uh, you're the director of uh, 1517, is it 1517 Ministries, or what's the... It's just 15, 1517.org, um, or 1517, and I'm the executive director. Um, I've been with 1517 for full-time, for going on uh, a little over four years now. Wow. Yeah, I figured it would have um, yeah, started in 2017, but you got kind of a, a head start on it, yeah? We had a run up, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, some uh, some preparations that needed to occur, and we needed to sort of get some brand recognition before 2017. And so, yeah, uh, we started. I think the official uh, before I was I came on. I think the official beginnings of it go back to 2012. Okay, so are the people with a lot of foresight 
or people that are just enthusiastic about um, uh, Lutheran doctrine and uh, his vision of Christianity. Yeah, and um, you know, gospel proclamation, I'd say, is the and the defense of the faith are sort of the two bulwarks. Um, so we we rest on proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to a, a world that desperately needs to hear it, um, and also the defense of that gospel, usually through something called the evidential apologetic. Okay, okay. So evidential as opposed to presuppositional, as opposed to presuppositional or classical. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a that's a whole other discussion for a whole other podcast. Not yeah. for us today. <laughs> Not for us today. Um, okay. Yeah. I guess I'm in my mind. I have the 2017 kind of fixation because that's when I discovered 1517.org. Uh, because oh, yeah. I, along with I'm sure so many other pastors and teachers, in October of 2017, I did a, a series on the five solas of the Reformation. Um, and I found the Thinking Fellows podcast, of which yep. you are a co-host, as you talk through those things, and also spent time poking around on the 1517 website as well. Uh, but I realized you existed before that, and you, you, you exist long after that, but that was my, my entryway into it. Yeah, it's sort of, that's sort of one of the dangers when you affix yourself to a year. <laughs> it's like, people are like, are you go still going on? Yes, we're, we're still happening. But um, yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the, and I'd say even all of the gospel proclamation side of that um, is attached to the Reformation and the rediscovery of the gospel um, and how that changed everything. Yeah. Yeah, it, it benefited from it so much. And like I said, I listened to all, all, all of the Thinking Fellows podcasts and then stuck around and have been listening to, to more. So I probably feel like I know you a lot more than you know me. Um, well, thank I've you. Heard your, your, your musings and thoughts about things already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's been, that's a fun show. We started that show in my garage um, years and years ago. Yeah, and I just caught the, the latest episode, which was filmed, I guess, like actually filmed on video in a, a living room. So congratulations, you've been brought into the home. Well, we actually have a studio. Um, we just, uh, because of the coronavirus stuff, we haven't, uh, we've gotten out of the habit of coming together personally um, to record the show. We need to get back into the habit. One of our co-hosts took a position in Chicago um, as provost of Concordia University in Chicago. And so that's made uh, logistics difficult. <laughs> Hmm. Well, okay. Well, I heartily commend it, and there'll be a link to it uh, in the show notes. Uh, but the question that we start most of these episodes with, and it's a good way to kind of even get to know uh, you as the guest and as a preacher, uh, the question is, um, you know, Scott, can you remember the first sermon that you ever preached? Um, where was it? How did it go? Um, can you bring us into that first sermon of yours? Uh, the first sermon, I probably don't remember, but not long after the, f because, probably because it was so horrible. Um, mm -hmm. this is a lot of out of your memory. Um, but not long after that, um, I preached a sermon, I guess I'd call it a bit of a series um, on Romans 10. Um, just a great gospel proclamation chapter of the book of Romans. And I did the sermon on how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And I remember it because at the time I actually, my wife and I, as I was finishing my PhD, we owned a running shoe store. Um, no and way. One of, the, one of the things that we did were personal shoe fittings. Um, and so I had great experience with feet and um, knew f just from firsthand experience how ugly and disgusting feet are. And so the fact that Paul then writes, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring the good news was really, it really hit me hard because I thought of just the feet at how bad they are now in modern shoes and tech socks and, you know, with good podiatrists and, the, the, you know, and medicines that can handle foot fungus and all this other stuff and how still disgusting the average foot is, how gross must a foot have been during the time of Jesus walking around and sandals. And I thought, you know, there's no, if, if you are a, a person um, in Paul's time, as he writes this letter to you and he says, feet are beautiful, you know, that he's, um, he's saying something there because if the gospel can make feet beautiful, it can make anything beautiful, even a sinner like me. Oh man, that is, that is great. That is very memorable. Uh, you know, when I was in, in Bible college, I got a side job at uh, big five sporting goods. 
or um, we called it Cinco Grande as uh, <laughs> to make it sound more more exotic. But I was I was in the the shoe department, and so I and I, and I got hardly any training at all. I'm sure a proper shoe store would just roll their eyes at. Um, at my attempt to sell shoes or even fit shoes, but it was my first day there, and um, someone came in and she was in a cast. She had just gotten her foot out of a cast and has been there for weeks, and her foot was swollen until so she needed someone to come and size it. And so oh, the yeah. new guy, me, got to hold her like swollen, sweaty foot <laughs> and try to to guess the proper size that she was mm -hmm. now. You know, feet are gross. That's just how it is. So when Paul says that, you know, he's really saying something. Yeah. So that that's a killer illustration. Did did the sermon go well? Uh, yeah, it did. Um, I'd say I was a, a theology student. Um, I had an undergrad in theology and a master's in theology at that time. It was a decent way through my PhD, um, but I was not a pastor. And so... Okay. Uh, I could write really well and I had, um, you know, I could teach um, and had been teaching for several years at that point, but I'd never had like a proper homiletics course or anything like that. And so um, preaching for me was a matter of finding um, excellent preachers and emulating what they did um, more than anything else. And so my uh, doctoral supervisor, Dr. Jim Nestigan, um, is one of the best preachers I've ever heard in my life. And so I sort of immersed myself in Nestigan sermons. And um, the more I did that, I'd say the, the better sort of my preparation got and um, delivery. I was big on uh, prepping pretty hard at the beginning of the week and um, sort of practicing delivery towards the end of the week. And so the more I sort of got that rhythm down, the, I'd say the better they got, the more well-received they were. Okay, yeah, we'd love to, to circle back and, and to hear more about that weekly rhythm that you eventually developed. But I'd like to ask, you kind of mentioned sort of briefly, uh, you said that when you started, you know, you were not a pastor and that you had been, you know, teaching um, and I, I wonder, what's that distinction? What distinction do you see between even like theological communication and then what you were saying is like, you know, that you were not yet a pastor and so didn't have a pastoral form of, of teaching or preaching? So um, I think for a lot of people, there's not a great distinction between the two. Um, I was at, at that time and still immersed in um, ideas of proclamation that started with some um, 20th century figures, but came to me through um, the writings of a man named Gerhard Ferdy, um, whose book Theology is for Proclamation was uh, life-changing to me because up until that point, I had been studying to be a theologian for the purpose of postulating on theology, which now I see is a somewhat useless endeavor sometime. Um, not useless, I shouldn't say that, just um, not the end. Not not the end goal uh, is just not po postulating isn't the end goal. I don't think I would have said that at the time, um, but reading theology is for proclamation. You know, Ferdy makes the point that the purpose of doing theology is for proclaiming the gospel to a, a dead sinner. Um, there's another person that influenced me in great bit and um, Norm Nagel. Um, and then another one, Bob Kolb. Um, Bob Kolb has a line that the preacher is the hitman and the midwife of Christ. Um, with the gospel, he's a hitman. He kills uh, the person in the pew. Uh, with, sorry, with the law, he kills the person in the pew. And as, as he proclaims the law, and with the gospel, he brings them back to life. He's then the midwife. So he's a hitman and the midwife. And preaching, um, and, and Gerhard Ferdy makes a distinction between first order proclamation or, and second order, or pr first order discourse and second order. Um, second order is what we get a lot of in my church, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, which is where uh, pastors will give a sermon that say it's about Jesus. Um, this is what Jesus did. Um, this is who he is. It's a lot of explanation, right? This is historical context, okay. this reading, um, and not always a great connection between the Jesus that did all these things and the Jesus that did those things for me. 
Um, first order discourse focuses on the for you-ness of this. Not only did Christ die and rise again on the third day, but he died for you and he rose again on the third day as the first fruits of your resurrection. Um, that's first order discourse. It's not just Jesus forgives sins of the world, but Jesus forgives your sins. First order discourse. Um, or in the said sort of as a preacher, in the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive your sins, um, first order discourse. And the more I sort of uh, learned to do that, um, I'd say little by little, I became a better preacher um, and less of a teacher in the pulpit. Um, and I do think there's a distinction there. Um, teaching, I'm really good at teaching. I, I've memorized a lot of historical facts and I can uh, blurt them out on demand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And even be gregarious while doing it um, and entertaining. But that's not the same as preaching. Um, preaching is for the sinner. Wow. Thank you for, for that. In fact, I, I was listening to a, a podcast of yours um, earlier, and I wrote down a note, and I wrote down, First Order Proclamation. What is that? And Thanks. thank you for beating me to it. That was going to be my insightful question that I was going to ask you. Um, but it obviously is so important to you that – yeah. without even being asked that you, you explain it. So it sounds yeah. like, I mean, book, his second. Too, I would say uh, Gerhard Freddy's theology is for proclamation. We don't even sell it. So this isn't like something <laughs> it's uh, it's great. Um, okay. So, so second order is kind of uh, historical or it's, it's truth, or maybe would you say historical, would you use didactic as, as a description of second order? Sure. It's, it's teaching. You know, it's, um, it's giving you the facts. It's giving you the details. It's giving you the logic behind it. Um, and I do a lot of that and I love it. I mean, I just, at my own church, I just got finished before Corona with 18 weeks teaching on the Augsburg Confession and it was great. Now my son sat in on a few of those classes. And he's like, you're a horrible teacher. I go, what do you mean? He goes, you turn every one of these classes into a proclamation sermon. And I'm like, oh, okay. So it, it influences and it crosses over. Um, but I'd say every, and I'll say this pretty bluntly, I think every sermon needs to have a first order proclamation in it, um, or it's sort of, it's missed the mark a little bit. Okay, but maybe and some people maybe are hearing this, and maybe they're hearing you say, oh, so there needs to be points of application throughout the sermon. Is that first order proclamation, points no. of application? I, no, not really. Um, and I'm not opposed to points of application um, unless they're sort of left as a sort of hanging chad. Um, you know, if they're, if they're just sort of left out there, now go apply this in your life and people leave. Oh my goodness. That's sort of, that can get very depressing at times. Um, but first order proclamation is you, the preacher standing <laughs> before the proclaimed to <laughs> and giving them the good news of Christ's death and resurrection for them in that moment. Um, not just talking about the, the person work of Christ in a historical context, um, mm -hmm. but actually giving Christ literally to the people. Um, he, he literally tells us this in John 20 and other places that when the preacher proclaims the forgiveness of sins that he's doing so in his name and that he's freeing them. He's, he's freeing the lost. That's, that's what I think. Uh, well, honestly, that's what we started a project called the craft of preaching. Um, and the goal with that is to, to teach pastors, um, you know, first order proclamation really um, to, to give my doctor father calls it handing over the goods to give them the goods, you know, don't hold mm -hmm. it back. This is, this is why you're here. Um, yeah. You may have great life advice, but people outside the church have great life advice too. You may have great points of application for their life, but people outside the church have that too. The thing that you have as a Christian preacher that is unique is the gospel of Jesus Christ for the sinner. And they will get that nowhere else. Wow. It, and if you don't wow. give it to them, they won't get it anywhere. Wow. That's yeah, why and you said in your prayer that this is a high calling. That's why it's a high calling. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, man, I'm excited. I, wanna, I can't wait until Sunday. I want to preach right now. You're, you're stirring <laughs> me up. Um, so, yeah, so it's like, yeah, there is this wonderful news. And, and perhaps we agree on this. This is good news for saint and sinner alike, for the believer and the unbeliever alike, that this, this gospel needs to be proclaimed. 
And why would you, why would you withhold that from them? Why would you right. keep it to yourself or assume that they know it? Yeah, we have a we have a saying um, sometimes that we'll throw around. It's it's kind of snarky, but the gospel is for Christians too. Let's not forgive that, you know. Yeah. Forget. Sometimes we can get very focused on um, evangelism, right? Giving the gospel over to those people that are outside the church that are for mm-hmm. the lost, you know, the quote unquote lost. But we forget that the gospel not only engenders faith and brings people to Christ, but it also is the thing that keeps them there, keeps them in the one true faith. Um, yeah. It does both of the gospel into salvation is a, is a power that occurs every time the word of Christ is preached to the center. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I, I probably agree with it so much that I'm actually trying to incorporate more of the fact that the gospel is for sinners. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, that, and I think I've, you know, I've had you know, someone's called it like a a gospel renaissance or, you know, just having this, this moment of realizing this is amazing. And, and so many of my sermons over the, over the years have been just celebrating the goodness of the gospel or showing, you know, X, Y, or Z about, about the goodness of the gospel. And then I'm, I've been trying to incorporate or to include, you know, even without being manipulative or reductionistic invitations for people to believe in this for the first time. Um, realizing that in the city where I'm in, you know, evangelical Christians or believers in Jesus are a very um, small minority. And to not just have our little holy huddle and be like, isn't this great? Isn't this yeah. wonderful? But we to, got the- to even have, it, yeah, we have the goods. We have the goods. But to extend the offer that other people can, can have this good um, saving relationship with Christ as well. Um, yeah, I mean, the episode will be out by now, but I did a good um, interview with uh, Dr. Ian Clary about evangelism in the early church and how we can evangelize um, in a way that does honor to the text and does honor to the Lord, but also extends the offer to the world. Yeah. I mean, this is um, going all into all the world, um, baptizing and teaching them to obey everything I commanded. Now, what does he command? <laughs> I and the father in one. Um, he that knows me knows the father. I mean, just all these things about, about him and about the, how trust and reliance in Christ alone so you did a series on the solas, on Christ alone, solas Christus, is the thing. It's it. That, that's all there is. And that faith um, to be Christ's child and to trust him wholly for your life and salvation and freedom uh, only comes. I mean, the, the scriptures are pretty clear on this. Only comes uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit when the gospel is proclaimed. Um, we have a we have a category for it in the Lutheranism called the means of grace. Um, it's one of the things that sort of uh, helps our sacraments have a pretty high importance in our theology. Um, but it's based on the proclamation of the word, um, because that's where the promise that the Holy Spirit will come in all his power is given by Christ to us. Um, wow, this is going wonderfully off script. <laughs> Because you answered my questions way too early, and now you're bringing in all these other things. <laughs> but this is this is excellent. So, I, you know, it, I, I normally would ask, how have you grown as a preacher since then? You've already answered that, like, you know, very, very much that you've, I guess, gone further and deeper into this um, proclamatory aspect of, of the gospel and the role of a, of a teacher as that uh, first order proclamation. Has there been other kind of ways that you've grown since that first Romans 10 sermon that you did to, to now? Well, I don't preach um, regularly anymore. Most of my, um, I do a lot of teaching. Um, I teach at the university um, down the hill. Um, I teach at our local congregation. I travel all over the world teaching. Um, But one of the things I've learned is that I used to, so I used to get sort of speaking gigs and I'd say, they'd say, hey, can you come do a class on I don't know, um, Philip Melanchthon's early life in theology, which is because that's who I did my my PhD on. And I'd come and I'd just do that. Here's the facts. And now I really, um, I try to see every opportunity as an, because I just, as as an opportunity for proclamation of Christ Jesus to the sinner. And so every, like my son accused me of, you know, every class I teach, I hope ends up being um, maybe uh, an opportunity for them to hear that Christ has forgiven them through his own precious blood, period, the end. Um, and that if you're talking about the Reformation, you're talking about apologetics, you're talking, there's only one reason we do any of this, and it's to let the sinner know, to give the sinner the goods, you know, and yeah. 
So um, I preach occasionally now. Um, my process is um, pretty much similar to what it was. I'm a uh, I'm an outline guy, and so I very much, you know, if I have an assigned text to me, I will go through the text. Um, I'm much better in Greek than in Hebrew, so I usually stick with the New Testament text and try to muddle my way through uh, through that in the Greek and then sort of find uh, in it what I think where the gospel is maybe hiding sometimes and highlight it and um, bring it to the fore and proclaim it to the sinners. And um, then I'll spend, as I write that outline, I'll spend, you know, probably um, two or three times on Thursday, two or three times on Friday um, and go through it and then try to forget about it um, until Sunday, wake up early and go hit it one more time. Oh, okay. So, so you said earlier that the, text work or the prep work is in the beginning of the week and then you're working on it more on a more <clears throat> homiletical level on on thursday is that it you know delivery how how is this going to be delivered um i use outlines they're pretty detailed um the reason i like those is because i can i can use as much of it as i want um mm -hmm. and as an outline is sort of tiered i can kind of stay high level or mid-level or detail level um you know, I can usually commit to memory um, at least the high and most of the mid-level. Um, and so then I work on rhetoric. Um, for me, I don't usually preach as I would teach. Um, I teach with a lot less preparation. Okay. And that's mainly because I'm teaching things that I've spent years preparing for. But if I'm assigned an individual text, um, I might not have spent years prepping that text. And so um, I do the prep work um, and I do it early in the week. Um, you know, several hours at least, and uh, which is different for me because I have, you know, several other jobs too. And so even when I was preaching um, full time at several other jobs, and so I dedicate as much time to it as, 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 as reasonably possible. Uh, yeah, isn't it the truth that, you know, for me, I am a, I'm the, you know, lead pastor, the main preaching pastor, but I have so many other jobs <laughs> and, and, and that, that preaching preparation must be guarded. And in fact, even, even I must admit this, this week, it's been really encroached on by a lot of crises here and there. And so it just, it just must be guarded. And so tonight's going to be a late night, but I have this yeah. little wonderful, wonderful pre pre-planned discussion with you as a bit of encouragement here today. <laughs> I have a good friend who uh, named Paul Koch. He's he has up the craft of preaching section of our website. He's um he's rigorous in his uh, schedule. So I mean, it's every week Tuesday from I don't know, say ten to two. That's when he's going through the text. Um, Wednesday is when he's writing it. Uh, Saturday is his memorization day. You know, he, and he's rigorous. I I found that I that kind of rigor doesn't. Mm. I'm. I'm self-motivated enough to know that I'll get it done and not procrastinate it too much. But I think if there's something to that, if you're somebody who knows that you're going to, your tendency is going to be to put it off to just setting like a schedule Tuesday, I do this Wednesday, yeah. I do Friday, I do this, you know, on and on. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just came across like the most convicting thing of my life just a moment ago. Um, it's about procrastination. Uh, it's that, Oh, my internet cut out. And actually, you're paused, too. We'll have to edit this out. You there? I'm here. I can hear you just fine. Oh, you can, you can hear me mumbling to myself. Okay. <laughs> I just, okay. just leave it going well, if that happens. So I just left it going. Sure. Now, now that you're back, or now that I'm back, really, uh, this is uh, Rosie O'Neill said this. Procrastination is the arrogant assumption that God owes you another chance to do tomorrow what he gave you a chance to do today. Which, uh, convicting which story. Thinks. <laughs> that's, yeah, you, you said uh, before we started, you wanted to go through some law and gospel. I'll just preempt that and say, that's some heavy law right there. <laughs> okay. Is, is, is the gospel hidden within it? Or do you think that's merely um, a, a lost thing with it. no hope? I didn't hear it. Um, so okay. maybe, you know, I've, one of the things, procrastination is a funny thing. So I've been self-employed a good part of my life um, and or um, 
It's going to sound really arrogant or, and or the boss um, for a decent part of my life. And when you're in those two positions, there aren't usually a lot of people telling you, okay, today I need you to do this, 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 and this, and this, 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 and this. And so, yeah. you, you know, if, um, if you procrastinate, the person that pays for that um, is, is you. Now, if you're sort of tyrannical and being a boss, the, per, the people who pay for that will be your subordinates, right? But if you're sort of just an honest person who procrastinates, you're, you're the one that's going to pay for that. But one of the things I've learned is that, um, that people tend um, towards uh, being procrastinators or not. Um, and sure, you can change that. Um, you could work to change that. Um, I think it's better just to know your tendencies um, than to sort of just ride yourself about it. Like if you know your tendencies, i.e. my buddy Paul, um, set yourself a schedule and then make that schedule sort of the routine. Now, is that a law to you? Sure it is. But that doesn't, just because you say something is a law statement doesn't make the law bad. Um, even if we're talking ca- yeah, cap- yeah. capital L law as, as given to us by God, um, this is obviously not bad because he decreed it and we know that he is good, but in being um, not bad, it can still be convicting. And, and in fact, okay. one of the things that we would say is that uh, the law always accuses um, the law may motivate to, it may uh, teach as well. It may be a pedagogue um, may teach you as well. But one of the things that it, all, it may restrain and keep order. And it certainly does do that. Um, but it always accuses, it always accuses. Um, and that's just something to know about. That's something to know about it when you're a pastor. It's something to know about it when you're raising children. It's something to know about it if you're, if you manage people, it's just something to know about it that you may tell somebody, um, you know, and as a pastor, you may preach and sort of give the list of things that will uh, lead you to a godly life. And you got to know that there are going to be, at least a decent number of people in your pews that are experiencing that as conviction. Mm -hmm. And um, then what, which is why I'd always say it's not, it's uh, every sermon needs to have law and gospel, but I do believe every sermon needs to end on the gospel. Um, People need to be free from that conviction um, before they walk out the door. The law is not, especially if we're talking little L law, right? Law is not um, unique to the church. It's, it's, it's part of our everyday experience. Uh, kids know this more than, more than we do, I think. And um, we've, we've uh, adapted law as habit. And so it's just sort of habit to us. But kids still experience law as law because they have very little control. And um, it's convicting. And, you know, it's not a bad thing. But the convicted needs a release. And that's why Christ died, to release the convicted. So let's give them the thing that we do have. Uh, let's give them Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So, so coming back to my, my pithy quote that I found about procrastination and, and then the author also, you know, drags God into it as well. (laughs) um, Saying that, you know, God gave you the time and you're arrogantly assuming that he, that he will give you more time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I read that. And, and, and rather than you being like, Oh, Mike, that's killer quotes. You were like, that's, that's law. So does, is, is there, is there room for that at all in sure. a sermon? Like if you're teaching through Proverbs about slothfulness, like to have a convicting statement like that, should, should that be there? I think, I think, um, let me, in a sermon, let me, let me cogitate on that for just a half a second here. I okay. think uh, every sermon ought to be convicting. Um, you know, at every point at every, every sermon, um, the law, the actual law, the heavy duty law needs to be proclaimed. Um, in other words, the hitman and the midwife thing comes back again. Um, okay, yeah. but I'm not sure that that quote is a hitman quote. I think that might be more of a nanny quote, a clean up your room quote. Um, you know, a wagging your finger at somebody who's naughty quote. Um, mm-hmm. I actually like to see less wagging fingers in, in preaching and I'd love to see more actually slain. Uh, killing the sinner, um, breaking them down um, totally. Um, I'm not sure that would break me down. That might annoy me a little bit. But what? Okay, just, yeah. It, there's some truth in the statement that God might not give me a tomorrow, um, but chances are uh, he will. 
Uh, and, you know, sometimes the thing that was burdening me today is just as well done tomorrow as today. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, I would love to see more law in sermons, but I'd actually like to see the law in sermons, like the law. Like okay. you are a poor, miserable sinner. You have no hope apart from Christ. You um, can't good. even manage your time. What makes you think that you can stand before a, a righteous God, the Amen. Alpha and the Omega? Do that one. That's great. That's that is not wagging your finger. That's actually part of who I am. You just you just cut me to the quick, attacked me at the core of who I am as a sinner. Amen. Do that all day long. Okay. And then how how can how can the gospel then be applied to the 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 procrastinator, the poor time management person who's who's maybe just been cut to the quick and exposed by 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 God's word, or perhaps even just by a quote from from Rosie O'Neill. Yeah, well, the funny thing is, is that um, telling somebody that they're a procrastinator yeah. doesn't, um, doesn't even necessarily require the, God, the gospel per se. It maybe just requires um, some good advice, you know, and that's why I'd say that's not even, that's, that's not gospel. It's not even really good law for a sermon. Now, what you said, um, when you said, you know, you can't even manage your time. How do you think you can stand before a holy God? Okay, now that's the law. That's different than saying, um, oh, come on, do better, do better for Jesus, because God might, he gave you an opportunity today. That's, you know, that's, that's different than you looking at me as my preacher, as my pastor, yeah. and saying, you can't even manage your time here. What makes you think you're holy enough to save yourself? Now, how's, what's the gospel application to that? Mm -hmm. In the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive you your sins. I forgive all of them, the ones that you're aware of, including your procrastination, the ones that you're not aware of, the fact that you annoy the heck out of most people you meet. In the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive you your sins. Christ died for that. The danger that we have as Christians is by making the law so weak that we make it um, unnecessary for Christ to die to save us from that law and from that sin. You know, if you give me a procrastination sin that I can fix, Christ need not die for that. Yeah. But he did. Yeah. 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 In the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, Father, if there's any other way. You yeah. know, there's no Well, way. if people just would manage their time better, then they, would, they could save themselves. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There is another way. Okay. To, how about you go give them 12 steps to not procrastinate? It's like, oh, great. Mm. I'm so happy. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So and with that, like, pr I guess the, so the, the, the first order proclamation, which is not just that Christ forgives sinners, but that it's, it's Christ forgives you. Um, I, I remember the first time I, I encountered that or maybe maybe consciously encountered it. I was um, uh, visiting uh, family and relatives uh, back in Southern California. Uh, there was a, a an OPC church, an Orthodox Presbyterian church um, nearby. And I'd, I'd heard about that denomination. I've read little things and I was just so curious and they had a Sunday evening service. So I preached somewhere that morning and then I went and visited the congregation um, Sunday nights. I went by myself. I didn't know anybody. I just like wanted to, to experience it. I know it's not the same as your own denomination, sure. but I think there's some, some overlapping sure, um, rough things. Things. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I tell you, it was to, um, you know, the, the minister like had us like kneel and like consider our sins and, yeah. and, and to confess our sins to God. And I, I forget the liturgical thing. Maybe you're familiar with it or maybe not, but, but to confess my sin to God, and and then to consider them, and then he he read out, um, you know, from that Paul to Timothy, you know, that that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, right. and then it was like, and, and and you know, the word of God, you know, Jesus Christ forgives you of your sins. Now let's rise and sing Amazing Grace, and I was like, this is incredible. Like yeah. I am forgiven. Grace is amazing. I, I really, I really benefited from, from that moment. Yeah. It's called the absolution. Um, it's, um, and it's, an, it's in a liturgical church, it's the assigned time um, when, and it's usually done corporately um, when the congregation confesses their sins 
um, usually by reading a confession um, or having memorized it and just saying it. Um, you know, it's when you do it every Sunday, they're pretty easy to memorize too. You know, I can mm. tell you from even the old hymnal when I was a kid. <laughs> um, but, and then the pastor, um, the preacher gets up and stands before you um, as, a, as a little Christ for you that day. And in the name of Christ forgives your sins, literally forgives your sins. Now, I, some people who aren't uh, accustomed to sort of the liturg that liturgical practice um, sometimes feel a little off-putting that, that somebody can stand in front of a group of people and forgive their sins. Um, but we usually try to say, listen, this is, this is Christ doing the forgiving um, through the mouth of this preacher. Um, and as, and again, like in John 20 and other places, Christ says, whenever that preacher forgives your sins in the name of Christ, they are forgiven. Um, and it's, and it's called the absolution. And it's beautiful. We've done several episodes on, on the thinking fellows and it's just, I mean, there's nothing as beautiful on this earth as, and I've seen some beautiful places as the, mm. an absolution given to a sinner. Yeah. And and I don't know, you know, again, I, I went there by myself. I, I came alone. I left alone. I don't know the, the hearts of anyone else in that room. But I, I wonder if there was anyone else that was as excited to be forgiven that evening as I was, you know, having, having experienced it all like totally fresh. Nothing was memorized for me. Yeah. Um, That's and great. I was just and, hey, I was kind of looking around like, guys, isn't this, isn't this great? But, you know, it's our, you know, 70th week in a row uh, doing that. And perhaps the, the wonder was gone or perhaps they're just not an expressive bunch or perhaps I'm just some weird <laughs> visitor that they've never seen before and I've never seen since but I was just like so excited it is a one of the one of the I'd say there's a lot of benefit to a liturgical service and that's one of them is that you know you know you're getting if your pastor if you go to that church your pastor could mess up the sermon that week and you still would not in Christ um you know, and you would have gotten an absolution and that there's something beautiful to that the the danger is is that sometimes when things wrote um they you know you can you see them less um and you can see them less now i'll tell you um i travel to a lot of churches and when i go to a church where the absolution isn't present i miss it dearly and so even though i've been saying a form of the same confession uh, since i could speak um when it's not present it's dearly missed uh, and maybe that's just because I think about it a lot, but I, I think there are a lot of people who, um, some people just aren't that expressive publicly, but you know, when, when somebody forgives your sins, if you actually you know, believe that you're in need of that forgiveness, that is, that'll drop you to your knees, man. The pastor won't have to tell you to get to your knees. It'll right. drop you. Yeah. And, and I suppose, and maybe without getting into the, uh, the intra- um, intervarsity discussions of this, the differences between <laughs> Presbyterianism and Lutheranism or whatever. But I, I do remember him saying that, you know, like he said, you know, the Lord forgives your sins. Christ Jesus came in to save sinners. And like what you've mentioned more than once is that the, the preacher says, like, I forgive your sins. And yeah. I found that to be a little bit, I was more comfortable with what the OPC guy said than what yeah. you just said to me now. And yeah. of course, I, I know John chapter 20, just like you do. Um, I just have never, well, it's a, maybe it's more of a, a reactionary feeling more than a thoughtful consideration. Um, maybe the, um, the thing is, is it no, I don't know of one pastor who, when they say, I, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And instead of by the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive all of your sins. I don't know of one pastor that when they say that actually believes that it's simply them, yeah, you know, yeah. and their will, <laughs> Ooh, that's a tricky word. Um, that is forgiving the sins not this of, discussion, not this discussion. <laughs> is forgiving the sins of the, of the parishioners, right? Um, the understanding is, is that you are the mouthpiece. And if you're not the mouthpiece, who will be the mouthpiece? Um, and so, in the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive your sins. That's ex I, I honestly believe that's exactly what he calls us to. He calls us pastors to do that in congregations, and he calls Christians to do that to one another, and he calls fathers to do that to children and mothers to do that to children and husbands to do that to wives. And if we just go along saying, get in a horrible fight with your wife, you know, and 
it's just horrible. It lasts for hours and it ruins your entire Saturday. And then at the end of that, you go, well, I was just reading in the Bible and I'm pretty sure Jesus is going to forgive you for that. Um, oh, okay, thanks. Or you can say, um, you know, I apologize for the things that I said. And your wife places her hand on your head and says, you are a child of God adopted by Christ. And in the name of that Christ, I forgive you. That's what you're called to do. That's what she's called to do. That's what you're called to do in return. That's the forgiveness of sins from one sinner's mouth to another sinner's ear and into that sinner's heart. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, breaking that heart of stone into a heart of flesh and bringing them to forgiveness, faith, peace, freedom, all in the name of Christ. That's the calling. Wow. Yeah, what can I say? Yeah, maybe I'll do it this Sunday. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, yeah. That's, Everybody, that's, you'd be like, say what? <laughs> well, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. You know, I, I, I mentioned this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Ireland. I'm in, I'm in post-Catholic Ireland. And, and as I, my, from my story earlier on, I do have this, like, this liturgical um, bent or draw. You know, I, I have a book of common prayer that I keep on my desk that I, and I, I really enjoy those things. And I'm, I have this rich appreciation over the years. I've, I've been pastoring here for uh, up to close to 15 years and I've tried to introduce things and my ex Catholic um, congregation. Yeah. It's is, fearful. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> nope. We, we left that for this. Um, and, then, and, and so when I, when I kind of reflect on what we're at right now in 2020, the elements of, of liturgy that we have incorporated into our service now is, is far more than I tried to back, back 10 years ago, but it's just been a kind of a slow, gradual building things in, whereas I was kind of enthusiastic and tried to just force yep. people to, to say things. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a, um, I mean, two things. You need to be mindful of your congregation. I mean, that's certainly, certainly. true. And, and their context and their history. Um, and... Uh, but I also think understand that every church has a liturgy. Every church has a liturgy. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Whether they acknowledge that they have a liturgy and own it or they don't. Um, yeah. But everyone does. And then there's the, the second question, which is, well, first, do you acknowledge that you have a liturgy or do you not? And second, the liturgy that you have, is it good or is it bad? Yeah. Um, and, you know, some, there's some bad liturgies out there. Um, and there are some good ones. And, you know, if you can incorpor incorporate parts of that, but again, be mindful of your congregation's history and their context. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not, and it's funny, I get accused on our side of being anti-liturgical, which is hilarious to me. Um, but I'm not arguing for, you know, something straight out of the Book of Common Prayer. I'm just saying, you know, if, if it helps you to put to remember to forgive the people's sins by putting it in the service somewhere, stick it in there, man, because they got to have it. If they, like I said before on this, if they don't get it from you, they're not going to get it during the week. So you hand over the goods. Don't be stingy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe on that note, Scott. Um, yeah. Thank you for this conversation. It's been, yeah wonderfully off script and um, uh, really personally enriching. Is there anything that you've been like waiting for me to ask you? Did you want to say something to the, to the, to the low church, um, yep. to the, the heroes of the expositors collective? No, I, I mean, I, I'll say this, that, um, and we didn't get into it, but I, I really wish that um, my Lutheran brothers would adopt um, some of the expositor practices um, that I've seen elsewhere. Um, there, is, there is a real opportunity within Lutheranism, I think, to teach the Bible um, more than we do and to, while doing that, proclaim Jesus Christ um, in every, as breathed out in every section of the text. Um, we, have, we have a theology that would allow us to do that and to do it well and uh, for historical reasons and practical reasons and whatnot we typically do um, more thematic what i think is called thematic style preaching and um i i think an influence of some expository preaching within our world would be good and i think an, an influence of some first order proclamation and law gospel preaching within the expositors world would be good too it's one thing to just go through the text line by line it's another thing to see the all of the text points to Christ Jesus as the only hope for our salvation and to be sure that that is brought out of every word breathed through the text of our Lord. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, I'd look forward to that. I'd encourage people if they, if they can, go check out 1517.org. It's real simple. It's just numbers, 1517.org. See what we got going on there. If your pastors are interested to craft a preaching, um, we've got some real heavy hitters that contribute to that. I mean, just really, really world-renowned authors that contribute to that. And so check it out. Yeah, I've, yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, so many things to, <laughs> yeah, wholeheartedly. I, I agree speaking from the exposit, you know, as a representative of the Expositors Collective and part of like the expository teaching and preaching community. Uh, yeah, there's a, a huge difference between what, you know, what some people call just reading and rambling, just read a verse, talk about it, move on to the next verse, read a verse, talk about it, make some little comments about how this could apply to your life. I and mean, like, that's, I don't even, we don't even consider that proper expository preaching. That's just, just working your way, meandering through a passage. That's not our goal. And we're trying to, to raise the standard to, yeah, have it be a, a Christ focused, uh, God glorifying journey through a text um, where the main point is, is heralded. Um, and the craft of preaching. Yeah. It's a great podcast. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, a cool, I think it'd be a good uh, parallel to the Expositors Collective. So if you like this podcast, you'll probably like the other one. Um, they're a bit smarter over there. Um, so you have to put on your, your big boy pants and uh, listen to the craft of preaching. And, uh, and, and they have access to just um, for free. I mean, one of the things about it is, I mean, there's blogs on that site. There's, there's audio video on that site. But through that yeah. site, you have access to just, um, I mean, just some really heavy hitters for free. Yeah, and I listened to to most of the uh, some audio stuff, and it's it's lectionary based. Is that is that right? So it, usually they're usually within the Lutheran Church. Um, they use lectionary either the one year or the three year. Not so different from Anglicans. In fact, I I'm fairly certain that we use the same lectionary. Um, and it's you know I've. Uh, I think it's, there's parts of it that are good, um, especially for the way our guys are taught to preach. It sort of keeps them in the text, um, at least um, at some level, um, mm -hmm. if they use it. Um, the, I think the idea behind the three-year is that if you sort of go through the three-year, you will have hit all the major portions of the Bible in three years. Um, okay which is <laughs> Lutherans are bad at studying their scriptures. And so, you know, any, anything that sort of gets them in the text, even for a while, um, I think is helpful. Um, I wish that weren't the case, but it really is. Um, and so, but there are other, you know, there are other ways to do it. And uh, the only thing I don't like about our lectionary is sometimes we'll get guys that say, well, this is, this is how you do it. I'm like, well, you know, that's, there, there's more than one way to peel an apple. Hmm. Well, okay. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Like, it's a, it's a great resource. I, I really am, I want to send people towards it because it's benefited me personally and I uh, commend it to you guys. So uh, again, Dr. Scott Keith, thank you for your time and uh, really appreciate this interview. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, thanks again to Scott for that conversation. I mean, First order proclamation, second order proclamation, uh, liturgy, um, procrastination. I mean, what a what a wide range of conversations, and it really truly was a delight. As I mentioned earlier, the show notes are going to have links for more ways that you can connect and even learn from um, Scott and the others at the 1517 organization. So. I'm here to remind you to make sure that you are subscribed, that whether it's through Spotify or Apple Podcasts or however it is that you get these podcasts, you want to make sure that you're subscribed because every Tuesday and sometimes on Thursdays, um, we have episodes that come out. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to leave you with kind of an extended teaser for our next episode, episode 132 with Pilgrim Benham. He and I speak about the need for approval that often we bring with us, that preachers carry with us into the pulpit, and different ways that we can try to find or earn the approval of our audience or the congregation, and honestly, how wrong that is, especially when we consider that in the gospel, in Christ, that we are fully approved because of Jesus. 
So it's kind of a heart searching episode. So I hope that you're subscribed so that on Tuesday, this episode is automatically delivered to your device. I hope that this episode and all that we do at the Expositors Collective helps you to grow in your personal study and your public proclamation of God's word. All right, here's Pilgrim and I speaking about approval. Well, again, there's that awkwardness of of preaching your heart out to a, a blank camera, right? A, a, to a lens. So there's no immediate, you know. I know we know this, but like no immediate feedback, no no buy-in. You don't see any visual like agreement mm. or amen. Um, so you're just hoping and praying that it's landing out in the ether, you know, and, yeah. and making an impact. You get maybe a comment here or there. <clears throat> um, so for me, it was like it, it just seemed a bit awkward to try to force you know, some, some extra humor. Um, it, it just was like, let's get, and I think a lot of us like, let's just get to the text. Let's get to the, let's not add the extra. Um, like Palm Sunday, my, my preaching immediately went down from 50 minutes to like 20. Um, and hey. then it's, it's, it gradually progressively worked up, but, um, immediately it was like, we got to make this shorter. You know, sure. Preaching. Sure. Uh, yeah, because we're, we're we're picturing that there's you know families gathered or they're sitting on the couch and there's kids and so they're trying to make it a bit more punchy, hopefully. Yeah. And then the reality is, uh, we've found I don't know about maybe you have a more uh, godly devoted congregation. <laughs> um, l- lately, our numbers have been going kind of down on the Sunday and then kind of rising throughout the week. Um, we're, we have in-person services. We have a limit of 50 people. And then there's, you know, a, a larger portion that that stays home. And, you know, I was doing the math and it's not our whole congregation, but they're watching it later on in the week. So the live thing is, you know, uh, you, have, you find the same thing? Yeah, I found, um, well, during the pandemic, when it was at its kind of zenith, we realized the importance and the value, yeah, of of content maybe in the middle of the week. So, you know, um, maybe a midweek video, mm. maybe a Q and a, a live kind of thing, um, a devotional. Um, yeah, we realized, man, there's a lot of value in content that people can not just consume live on Sunday, though that's helpful and kind yeah. of unique. It's becoming less unique, but I think now, now the novelty, right. Is, um, Oh, I can select any time of the week to, to watch this. Um, so it almost you yeah. know, flipped the novelty a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can we talk about humor again? Yeah. (laughs) So so you've, you were saying given kind of like less jokes earlier on and are you continuing with like a less joke policy now? Yeah. I don't know if it's a policy, but uh, yeah. um, Just kind of went through this realization um, for me that a lot, a lot of it was going back and listening, you know, to sermons that I've preached. Um, and I think that's a super helpful thing. I don't sit and listen to a lot of sermons mm-hmm. um, per se. Like there's some powerful sermons that you have to listen to in your life, right? Maybe that's an episode. Um, oh, you know, just uh, most of whom are from Pilgrim Benham. Uh, yeah, the most impacting sermon ever. Um, like this week, we listened to Tim Keller's sermon um, that he preached the Sunday after 9/11. Yeah. Okay. And just fascinating. You know, powerful. Um, but I generally, as a rule, don't, um, I don't listen to a ton of sermons. Like if I'm going to study, we're about to start Song of Solomon. I'm not going to listen to like every great Song of Solomon, you know, um, message. Because for me, I want it to be uh, original content, so to speak, um, even though we've got 2,000 years of preaching. Sure. So, um, yeah, for me, it's kind of listening to my old sermons and realizing for, like I had this discovery. Like, man, I, I'm not getting a lot of reactions and when I do, it's kind of like a, you know, when you tell a bad pun and you get the, yeah. oh. Uh, so kind of the dad joke, you know, just a bit dry, a bit, uh, nothing off color or inappropriate, but just like, that's just not even that funny. And so I realized, man, I was reaching a lot and reaching for that approval. And I don't feel that need anymore. I guess the, the you know, preaching to a camera takes that away. Yeah. Uh, for me at least. So I just kind of turned this corner. Like, I, I don't need people's approval. I'm going to preach. What I'm going to preach, and I don't need, you know, to have laughter to know that I'm approved unto God. So that was kind of the big thing for me. Mm-hmm.